Freeform micro optics have the capabilities to revolutionize industries. Imagine automotive lighting that is perfectly aligned with the design of the car. Or lighting solutions that provide better energy efficiency, better light distribution and perfect aesthetics. Imagine all AR and VR capabilities with better resolution, feeling more realistic, yet the device reduced to a size that you don't even realize you are wearing or improving your home with luxury and smart windows. That is the power of freeform micro-optics. The ability to create optical shapes in any form you want, completely miniaturized for perfect integration. Opening up new opportunities for security and branding, optical communications, consumer electronics, and more. And now imagine that this can be done with equal or even better specifications than conventional systems, and at lower costs. This is why Fabulous has opened up the one-stop shop in freeform micro-optics, making this technology now easily accessible to everyone who wants to implement it, proving a full supply chain of world-class freeform micro-optics specialists. We can take you from design to prototyping and into pilot production. For full product lifecycle, including design, modeling, origination, tooling and manufacturing services, some have already paved the way by integrating freeform micro-optics into their product portfolio. Are you ready to take the next step in your product development? Make it fabulous and contact the one-stop shop for freeform micro-optics at info at fabulous.eu. We are fabulous. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jeremy Pico Clement from the Technology Manager at, at Epic, and I'm really pleased to, to moderate this uh, fabulous workshop of today. So we'll talk and learn about free from micro optics technologies uh, through highly relevant speakers from companies covering all the supply chain of micro optics from the design to the application, including fabrication and, uh, and metrology. And uh, yeah, the, the aim of this workshop is for you as participant to get the maximum information of Fabulous, get answers, and we have a technical presentation, but we plan also uh, to have a networking and Q&A session at the end of this workshop where you could discuss and exchange with the participants, but also ask any question you will have regarding Fabulous. Uh, we have in this room, Jessica Van Eck, who is the managing director of Fabulous. So she can give you all details you need regarding the, the project. So do not hesitate to ask any question you will have during this workshop. Um, so this workshop was organized on two mornings. Um, so the today's morning will be focused on automotive market. Yesterday we had a, a workshop on air VR market, and we had actually 13 relevant speakers on these two mornings. And why we decided to, to focus this focus on these two markets. Uh, so firstly, the, the XR market, extended reality market, is and will be one of the most dynamic markets of the next decade with an important CHGR. Photonics technologies that we already know the, are one of the pillars of extended reality, so air and VR market. And automotive lighting, so a constant growth and solid market, and one of the most promising markets for photonics in automotive industry with more than 30 billion estimated market in 2025. And we also know that the lighting signature is now a strategic way for companies for different sessions as well as uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicle lighting, so which will be really prevalent, predominant in the near future. A few use cases of Fabulous in air, VR, and automotive market. So on the left, uh, yesterday we had a presentation uh, from Limbach, uh, which presented uh, these uh, optical pieces for a virtual reality market, virtual reality system. We had also a presentation by Micro OLED uh, by Xavier Bonjour. He presented uh, their product for uh, augmented reality market. It's a headset, it's a glasses, sorry, um, for augmented reality for sports application. And we have also as a use case, Hela, uh, a headlight using freeform micro optics with uniform appearance in the on off states. Maybe if you have question about this use case, we have also Daniela Cartos in the room. So if you have question regarding this, I mean, I think that she, she, she could uh, answer you. Uh, the supply chain of today. So all these companies uh, are in the, in the room today. 
So as you can see, we uh, are able to cover all the supply chain of, uh, of micro optics for automotive. We have uh, uh, optics and micro optics uh, companies for 3D printing, like tensor prints, metrology, um, lithography mass components. We have uh, two micro optics, Nanocomp, Ontario, Wilhelm, uh, UPMT, and Power Photonics. We have also companies for photonics components and devices, software design, simulation, and analysis. We have system integrator today. Um, and we have also end users. Uh, just to have a quick look of the agenda of today, so we have um, a presentation by Jessica Van Eck, a presentation of Fabulous, um, and two different sessions. The first one will be about design and fabrication, with a first uh, presentation by Rainer Fodish from Synopsis. Um, we have also Mark Schnipper from Swiss Micro Optics and Nolan Chan from Fazix. And for the session two, but application, we have a presentation by Marcel Sealer from Glowing, Hagen Schweizer from Dr. Optics, and Paul Henri Mata from Volvo Cars. And as I told you, we'll uh, finish this workshop with a networking and QA session where we will uh, discuss together about Fabulous and about technologies. So thank you very much for participating to this workshop. Um, so as I told you, if, we have, if you have any question, you can contact us. So I'm Jeremy Pico Clement. You can also contact Jessica Van Eck from Fabulous. And uh, again, feel free to ask any question you will have in this workshop. It's a, it's a, a discussion uh, between us. So thank you very much again. And Jessica, if you want now, Jessica Van Eck, if you want to, to share your, your screen and start your presentation, the floor is yours. Thank you. So yes, <clears throat> thank you, Jeremy, for the nice introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining this workshop. So my name is Jessica van Heck. I'm the managing director of Fabulous, uh, the association for and pilot line for free for micro optics. And uh, so we saw already the video, but just to give you a, a small introduction. So free for micro optics is uh, uh, taking the advantages of free form uh, into uh, miniaturization. So that means that uh, there's a lot of flexibility, no symmetry constraints. And uh, you can create all kinds of different shapes. You see some examples here. And uh, so we are seeing also in the market that uh, there is an increasing demand, which is also why the European Commission decided to um, uh, uh, fund Fabulous. So uh, it started as a project with already aim to continue to offer its services after the project. And so for that, a legal entity was created, which I'm now running. And uh, um, as a fabulous, we really want to make sure that um, uh, free from micro optics becomes easily available. So, as I said, so we are the European pilot line and one stop shop. So, that means that we can offer accelerated innovation, uh, manufacturing services, and really support you from prototype to piloting to large volume production. And uh, so, we are uh, truly a single entry point for all these different services. And the reason why is because, especially if you're considering three, four micro optical components, uh, you need quite a lot of partners because uh, you need uh, uh, someone maybe with the design, the modeling, or origination, tooling, a material selection, replication, quality control, integration. So um, <clears throat> what we've done is uh, uh, work together with partners that are then uh, uh, fulfilling the full value chain to offer these services. So if we take a closer look, that means that really we can help you uh, with the design. Uh, we have several origination partners. We have uh, partners that can do tooling, material, quality control, and then uh, we can manufacture our micro optical components. Um, we do that by UV imprints on, on three pillars. So wave scale, roll to plate, and roll to roll. Um, so you have partners for those. We will have one uh, today here and uh, um, uh, partners for product integration. And, uh, and the project started with six use cases where we have been kind of testing this collaboration uh, and, and um, synchronizing all the processes. So we've been uh, working on some solid state lights application, transportation lighting, automotive lighting, AR, VR, micro displays and luxury. So that kind of also brings us to the topic of today, because today, of course, we are talking about the automotive uh, lighting. So when we take a look at that and we take a closer look, uh, um, maybe to uh, uh, one of those use cases. 
So um, Hella is here in the room, as mentioned, uh, if there are any questions, uh, um, um, we can uh, also uh, maybe answer that. But really it is about enabling the manufacturing of complex free for micro optical application for the automotive market. And uh, the benefit of course is that it really reduces uh, the need for additional lenses and uh, increases efficiency compared to other approaches. So um, if we take a closer look, then we see that micro optics allows for a combination of complex optical structures. And, uh, and yeah, so we can really reduce the complexity and, uh, um, yeah, and support the automotive industry in this way. So uh, um, there are many uh, main light functions that uh, can uh, uh, be targeted and uh, the aim is to have a uniform appearance um, and uh, if, so this is what we are doing right now with one of the use cases. And then of course, so within Fabulous, we have a, a, a lot of knowledge in general. So we will hear today also from SUS. Uh, they have a lot of experience in light carpets, but uh, of course they're also, so I will not say too much. I will let uh, SUS uh, explain a little bit more about it. So, and there are also all types of other applications that could be enabled by uh, the micro optics, so it can be used for interior lighting, heads up displays, infotainment systems. So, there are really quite a lot of things where uh, micro optics can uh, um, offer some benefits for the automotive industry. Then, to come back uh, uh, one more time to Fabulous. So, uh, really, we want to support all phases of the development from design to prototyping into replication and integration uh, towards large volume production through a single entry point. So um, um, with that, it may be also good to know that uh, uh, because the commission sees the importance of using these kinds of structures, they um, have uh, um, opened up a fund of 3 million uh, through an open call, uh, which is available for uh, European companies that uh, are looking to implement before micro optical components into their system. So it's open to all European companies. Uh, there are even a few countries outside of Europe that could be eligible. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, the funding is available up to 90%. So uh, that depends on the company size and uh, uh, the evaluation. Um, uh, and then it's a continuous open call. So it started running uh, early this year. And we will have cutoff dates then March to November this year and next year. Uh, so the next one would be June 2022. And if you want more information about this uh, on the website, there's a tab open call, or you can use this link directly. So this is, of course, not only available for the automotive industry. Uh, and micro optics can play uh, a huge role in, in many different industries. So we've seen already some of the use cases, but also in optical communication, security and branding, solar energy and daylight. Um, consumer electronics, uh, free for micro optics can play a role. So to conclude a little bit, so the single entry point, uh, giving access to your leading companies and RTOs that cover a full value chain, uh, but also the promotion of the capabilities because there is a lot of potential out there. And um, in order to make it easy accessible, it's important that we collaborate. So for that, also one of the things that Fabulous is doing is creating an ecosystem and marketplace. So this was launched end of last year and uh, it's meant to really showcase the extensive product offerings that are out there, not only from uh, our partners, but from any company uh, that is active in the field of micro optics uh, with the aim to become the main source of orientation. Uh, so you can register there if you would like to join. To give you an idea, uh, this is uh, our organization registry. So we have already here quite a lot more companies than uh, the current partners of Fabulous. Uh, and if you take a look at the marketplace for automotive, you see here uh, a right range of uh, offerings uh, by members, but also by non-members. So if you are interested in using micro optics, you can take a look at this system to orientate, or if you are a supplier, we would love to have you on board. So with that, um, I want to introduce also Tom, who is the technical coordinator at Fabulous. And so uh, we are here um, to support you if you want to uh, apply for our services, uh, interested in the open call, to join the ecosystem. I would say contact us. You can follow us on social media. And uh, with that, I want to say Micro Optics is Fabulous with a big thank you also to all the partners uh, in projects. And thank you so much for being here and listening. 
you have any questions. Thank you, Jessica, for this introduction. Any question for Jessica? Okay, well, maybe we can continue and Jessica will be here for sure uh, or this morning to, to answer your question. Okay, so let's continue with our first presentation, technical presentation, Rainer Fodish from Synopsis. Rainer, if you want to, to start and share your presentation, you can, you can start. So, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. I hope you see this screen yeah. now. That's this is fantastic, yeah. So I'm Rainer Fürdes from the company Synopsys, and Synopsys is providing uh, optical simulation software packages uh, for various uh, yeah, applications, uh, also for the automotive industry. And I would like to give you an overview <clears throat> uh, of some methods we are using uh, in the company, some different software packages we are using to simulate freeform optical components, um, micro optical components, and so on. Um, yeah, so it, it actually from, from light bulbs to, to photonics, uh, we, we can clearly see a trend to go smaller and smaller in the structures. I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, everybody had a big light bulb in the hand and uh, all the optics in the car were rather big and that was faceted reflectors only and some, some huge lighting uh, systems, uh, but uh, this, is, this is over and we are coming to a point where everything gets miniaturized. So we have different let's say simulation software programs in order to help you to create a new design or sophisticated design for lighting and um, for also imaging applications. First of all, there's our LucidShape and uh, LucidShape CIA software product that is uh, rather used for uh, front lamp or exterior lighting uh, of cars. Um, there is light tools, especially uh, um, interesting for interior lighting, uh, decorative light elements, but also sensor application, uh, LiDAR application, and head-up displays. And there's code five, which is our, let's say, more imaging software program where we can, let's say, create or design the imaging aspect of sensors, of head-up displays, of backward cameras that are now used very often in cars. And then we have a device tool that is called our soft design suite. Uh, that is uh, a tool uh, where we are, yeah, we, where we can design really, really tiny structures, so sub-wavelength structures. Uh, so we are calling this is our tool for micro and nanophotonic. Okay, just some basic concepts we are using here. First of all, lucid shape. What you can do in lucid shape. Uh, lucid shape was born with the idea in mind to have, let's say, uh, the designer wanted to uh, distribute the light in the far field somewhere. Let's say for uh, headlamp front lighting, and. Uh, some years ago, we were using all this kind of faceted reflectors, uh, hundreds of uh, facets or between 50 and 100 of, of facets very often used for front uh, illumination. And uh, what the designer was doing, he was just saying uh, to the facets, uh, please send the light in a specific direction. Here in this first approach, we want to send the light in, uh, in, in, in the in the in the yeah, in an angle of zero degrees, that means we want to focus the light. So, and instantaneously, the shape of the reflector is created or calculated. And if you have another application and want to spread the light more here, in this case, plus minus 10 degrees, uh, the reflector gets recalculated and have another shape at, at the end. And that's, that was the way where we are, let's say, creating faceted reflectors. You can see this here in the picture. We have many, many facets here. I think this is a real lamp example, but uh, as you can see, if you have two facets, you can clearly say uh, the first facet should do uh, or should send the light in a completely different way than the second facet here. The upper facet is sending the light and the range of uh, uh, that you can see here in the upper picture, uh, it's in the, in, the, in the range plus uh, uh, five to uh, 10 degrees and the lower reflector ascending in the, in the minus direction, the minus five to minus 10 degrees. And so you can have a separation between the, um, the reflectors. And so you can, yeah, with, with many of these facets, you can create arbitrary light distributions. So this system gets more and more smaller. So we are right now also working with faceted reflectors and faceted lens in the, in the millimeter range or sub millimeter range. 
um, but there are some challenges uh, coming with this. Also, of course, possible to create lenses, freeform lenses or lenses that have a certain purpose. Um, and um, yeah, especially for projector systems, but also for lens elements that are in a real lamp uh, application. Um, you can see uh, there, there are some yeah, freeform lens elements uh, created here on this kind of, of real lamp design um, to give a function, but at the same time also to have a nice uh, kind of good styling. Um, if you go more and more to more sophisticated freeform, let's say designs, you can also say to this facet, I mean, I, I need a more complicated light distribution of one facet. You can say, okay, I go to, let's say my first facet here, you can load a kind of very complicated light distribution. This is right now here done with this kind of Einstein picture. So we have a grayscale picture that mimics Einstein here and um, the facet will be a really, really freeform facet out of many points. It is a cloud of points. And at the end, you get your result and you get nearly the same light distribution as you can see. So that was uh, more focusing on lucid shape, then more for interior light applications, decorative light elements, also the structure getting a, a smaller and smaller and we have here in light tools a way where we can uh, create um, patterns or 3D textures. I call it mini and micro textures because normally uh, we are working in a site between 100 micrometer and one millimeter, sometimes two millimeters, but this is the size the extraction feature uh, has. And you can see these textures can be generated on a freeform surface or on a, let's say, curved surface. It could get on a reflector. It could get on a, on, let's say, on a, um, um, a flat surface, of course, and can have different functions. So we can control the light spread better. We can control color shift better. So we can use this feature as outcoupling structures in light guides and so on. And it is important to know is we have not only a few textures types, uh, it could be an arbitrary shape of textures. So you can create your own texture style and you can place thousands or 100,000 of these textures on a surface. Where is this used very often when you are looking in the car nowadays, there are very, very nice light elements, interior light uh, elements that um, yeah, makes your car interior wise nicer. And we are often use uh, this kind of backlight technology for uh, illumination. And what you have normally, we have a light guide, it's a PMMA plastic light guide. On top of this light guide, there is a texture. Uh, in the back, there's also a reflector to have a better efficiency. And then the light is getting, uh, it gets coupled out uh, in the direction of the user. And uh, what we can do in light pools is especially, especially that we can create a texture pattern uh, according to your yeah, light requirements or output requirements. It could be a uniform requirement. It could be a non-uniform requirement. But what I want to tell you is you have a source. And as you can see here, normally the source is uh, located at the edge of the light guide. Um, and um, the textures are here located on the light guide uh, directly. And we are optimizing the size or the location of this texture to couple the light out in a, most of the cases in a uniform way, as you can see this here with a planar structure, but also with a curved structure, of course, because everything is curved in a car. So you need to deal also with curved structures. So here you have your source, you have your light guide here. And what you see here in yellowish, this is just the light distribution that is kind of nicely uniform. And the texture you can see here, the texture density is varying, uh, uh, varying um, across the, the, um, the light guides. So you have areas where the texture density is, uh, far less uh, compared to other areas where you have extremely dense textures uh, um, uh, location. Um, here in this case, I was using 27,000 uh, spherical textures and um, yeah, optimization time for a relocation or let's say for optimized uh, location of these textures were about 10 to 15 minutes. This method is also used for light guide design. If you have this linear light guide designs, uh, we can also apply this texture here on it. Okay. Freeform designs, a more sophisticated freeform designs uh, can be done really nicely in light tools. So what we provide is the method that we are, can control, let's say points, uh, a cloud of points, uh, uh, different points that are located on a specific uh, UV coordinate system. And each of these points can be um, 
yeah, changed in X, Y, and Z direction. And we can calculate these lenses and to get, let's say, an arbitrary or very complicated light distribution. Huh? Okay, and this is working here um, for, especially for small light sources, and it works for illuminance targets and intensity targets. So also in the far field, uh, this application is useful. And of course, you can I create a free form lens, a single lens element. In my case here, that's a one millimeter by one millimeter lens device, but it could go smaller. So we had customers or we have customers that are working more on the, the micrometer range, but you should not go down to the wavelength range. So this is the limit what we have here on light tools because we are working here with geometric arrays. You see the light distribution can be rather complex. Um, and of course you can take this free form element. You can put this on a lens array here in this case, 20. Uh, by 20 uh, lens elements as resulting in uh, 400, uh, altogether 400 single lens elements. Okay, and we are working here in this case with collimated light. If you're going smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, let's say in the sub wavelength range, you need um, yeah, our rigorous methods here in our case, Richard's coupled wave uh, uh, analyzing methods. And this is very important when you are designing structures that are useful um, for, for meta lens systems. So meta lens is a very, very popular buzzword at the moment and everybody wants to go meta and meta atoms, meta lenses. And what we can provide is we have in our soft, we have a utility that provides you different meta structures or meta atom structures. And you can see the phase shift uh, provided by each, each, uh, each structure. And um, the interesting aspect here is code five, which is our, let's say, more classical uh, imaging device systems, or let's say for lens systems, for cameras and so on, can provide uh, the desired um, phase profile that we can implement into our soft simulator. And our soft is placing, let's say, the right structures uh, on the surface of this meta structure. Uh, so you're in outer areas to have, you have different structures. And then you, if you go more and more inside, your structure will changing. Also the pitch of the structure will changing. And of course you can do the verification by different methods, um, FTDD methods, uh, beam uh, propagation and so on. But I just want to say we are providing this, um, let's say feature and uh, it's, it's very common at the moment. Um, here are some other combined methods where we have a let's say a camera system designed in code five, you get a near field, let's say uh, yeah, light distribution here from code five, but how is this light distribution interacted with the microstructure with the MLA micro lens arrays on top of a photo diet? And you see the photo diet here together with a color um, filter, and you would like to see the absorption or diffraction effects uh, at the end of, of your system. And you can analyze this in combination with, with code five. And for illumination application, uh, you can say uh, that uh, our soft can create an arbitrary light distribution. You can put the moth eye structure or micro nanoscale structure on a surface. And the software is, um, is giving you a uh, BSDF data file, which is uh, corresponding to, uh, the, um, uh, to, the, to the way how the light gets reflected from a surface. And then you can apply this microstructure on, uh, let's say, a, a macro scale surface into light tools, and you can do simulations with it. So with this method, you can use LED, you can use, an, let's say, a nanoscale uh, microstructure or nanostructure, you can place this nanostructure on a macro surface and then you get an arbitrary light distribution. And there's my last um, example here. Uh, micro lens arrays are also very often used for projector systems in order to increase the efficiency and uh, um, in, um, in LCD panels. And then in front of the LCD panel, you see this micro lens arrays. Sometimes it is even smaller here. In my case, it's 10 micrometer. And as soon as you get even lower, it's in the range of one micrometer, you get problems with diffractions and also with absorptions. And uh, you can have, uh, let's say, crosstalk between the, uh, the lenses. And you can only calculate this in our soft. Uh, but this is, let's say, the combination between our soft and light which makes it possible to, to let the designer know in which direction the illumination system has, has to be designed. Huh? And um, okay, this is the, the benefit of combining nanoscale application with macroscale application. Okay, that should 
be my end of the talk. I hope I was still in time. If you have any questions, yeah, please let me know. That's perfect, Rina. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, and we have the first question from uh, Fernando Munoz Fernandez from Huawei. Do you want to ask a question by yourself, Fernando, please? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I see it here. Fernando. Uh, I, I know that uh, Light Tools have uh, well, uh, hmm. developed this uh, way of calculation uh, you, you have mentioned. And on the other hand, uh, Lucy Shape before being synopsis hmm. was calculating hmm. these, uh, these surfaces. Now they have merged, uh, they are using the same method or, or they are using their own method? Uh, no, uh, that, you're, you're right. Before we had designed as an, an light tools that I think it was released 2015 or 2014 and light tools or so some years ago, uh, we had this capabilities, freeform capabilities only in, in, in light tools. And in lucid shape, we had just the capability to say, please send the light in a certain direction. But since two years, roughly two years, we have implemented the light tools mathematical algorithm as well into lucid shape. So you can use the same, let's say, in, in the background, there is a there is a kernel that is, let's say, works in light tools and uh, in the background, um, you, you cannot see it, what, what, which method it is. You just press the button and then the user has an easy job to do. But the, mathem the mathematical framework uh, was provided by light tools. You're right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fernando, for, for our question. Any other question? Maybe, maybe I have one for you, Rainer. Can you, can you tell us what is your, your main challenge in terms of, um, of simulation of, of uh, freeform micro optics today? A little bit, it should be, be, I mean, such, we, we need to know what, what, is, what, is, what is needed in the industry. So we are just as a, as a software provider, we, we can program a software, but we need the input from the industry, what it's, what it's needed. So we get this input, uh, but it's sometimes challenging to, to see, is this really a need? And then is this just a niche market need? And then it's not worth to develop something for it? Or do we, or do we, do we have to develop something for it? I mean, uh, there, are, there, are, the, the, there are many things possible and we can provide everything right now. But the problem is to have the right answer for each application. Sometimes the application does not fit to the software and other way around. And the another biggest challenge, and this is always the biggest challenge, to combine the macro world with the nano world. Huh? So when you mm -hmm. are, work, I mean, normally we still have, and we, we still a little bit in between, we still have, let's say, lens sizes, 100 micro, 200. So is geometrical optics still enough or do I need already rigorous methods or FTTT methods and so on? And this is sometimes really challenging. But our biggest challenge at the moment is, but we are working on this, is to combine all the tools together huh? so that the user that is working, let's say, for general lighting or for auto car illumination can also use, let's say, our soft micro and nanostructures on a, on a macro structure, on a macro surface, the macro scale, and to just use it in a kind of easy way. So mm -hmm. because the ease of use is very important for software users, because you can you can put everything in a software, but if it's too complicated, nobody is using it. Huh? So it has to be it has to be user friendly enough um, yeah. uh, to to be attractive for the user. For sure. Thanks a lot, Rainer. Um... I see no other question. So thank you again, Renner, for our presentation. Really, really interesting. Thanks a lot. And uh, let's move on with our, our next speaker from Swiss Micro Optics. So welcome, Mark Schnipper. Mark. Hello. Yep. Hello. I'm sharing the screen here. No, uh, wait. Um, uh, Yes, here we are. I hope you okay. see my screen. Yes, you can start. <clears throat> okay, so hello. I'm Mark Schnipper from Swiss Micro Optics. <clears throat> so um, maybe a few words first about Swiss Micro Optics. So we are a supplier, a leading supplier of high quality micro optics 
Um, we are delivering uh, uh, key enabling components for data com, telecom, sensing, automotive, semiconductors, and medical application. We are located in Neuchâtel in Switzerland, just close to a nice lake. Um, you can see below the, um, the clean rooms. This is the, the first big clean rooms we had in uh, Autrive. And uh, last year, end of last year, we uh, we we made a second one uh, in in the middle of the city of Neuchâtel, uh, which is more dedicated for all the products uh, related to automotive. On the on the right side, you can see some components we are doing. On the top, it's a micro lens array. Uh, double-sided micro lens. We also do fiber couplers. We do diffractive optics <clears throat> and um, kind of beam homogenizer for, uh, for example, for UV uh, illumination. You can see also that our revenues are since twenty uh, since two thousand uh, seventeen um, <clears throat> increasing in automotive in twenty twenty. It's almost forty percent, more than forty percent, that uh, is coming just for automotive uh, parts. At Swiss Micro Optics, in fact, we are part of uh, the group Swiss Micro Tech, uh, who is uh, making machines for semiconductor industry. And at Swiss Micro Optics, we use what we call a wafer level micro optics. <clears throat> it means we use glass substrate to do the optics. In fact, why glass substrate? It increases the stability. We can also do lithography hatching imprinting on, on this kind of substrate using, of course, special tuned uh, imprint uh, uh, materials. And uh, with these um, mask aligners made by Swiss Microtech, we can also have a very high alignment accuracy by doing the stacking, we can do wave 11 stacking, we can integrate also inside the, the, the product some uh, metal structures, uh, like an aperture. And of course, on a wafer, you don't do only one element, you can do parallel manufacturing of micro optics. Uh, in some cases, it's over a few thousand lenses per wafer. Micro optics, I think, it's well known now that um, the advantages, it's slim, you can miniaturize, you can do the multiplication, you can see on the top right image, um, an old, uh, the, the difference between a micro uh, system and a macro system on the same volume, in fact, you can put much more with the same illumination, uh, you can put much more um, uh, elements, micro, opti uh, micro optics elements, sorry, and uh, microoptics also has a high efficiency through the by by using this um, multi-channel <clears throat> design. Then the functionality we can have precise definition of light distribution. We can have a high depth of field and also homogeneity. <clears throat> and last point, which is also very important, especially in uh, in automotive, we have a big freedom of design. We can have a modular construction. It's much lighter than conventional um, systems. And in fact, if you take the combination of all that, you have also a big advantage using uh, micro optics. One important process step we use at SUS micro optics for the automotive elements is this imprint lithography. You can see below um, a sketch how it works, in fact, how we, we do that. You come, you take a, a glass substrate, you can do a chrome coating with the lithography steps to have this aperture, and then you can, with specific stamps, um, do the imprinting on one and or both sides of, uh, of the glass plate. And uh, you can see also some, uh, some typical system or examples how this can be used. I mean, you can have a simple, uh, I call it simple because no, uh, no chrome layer, uh, double-sided uh, lens array. You can have with a chrome layer, you can have something like a stacking with a chrome layer inside, in fact, the, the, the glass substrate in a way, and of course, what we are also more more trying to do is to to use free form optics on one or both side of the of the product. So an 
uh, how, in fact, an MLA setup work. I mean, basic <clears throat> um, sketch and how it works. And it begins with, in fact, uh, LED. Then you have a condenser, a uh, collimator lens, sorry, which is then projecting the, the light on this um, MLA. On one side, you have the condenser lens. Let and the other uh, with an aperture, a chromium mask, which is an aperture, and then you have an array of lens who are doing the projection. On the on the right side, you see a typical parts used for light carpet in this case, and they are about one by one centimeters uh, wide. Here, <clears throat> this the first example of what we are doing. And at Zeus Micro Optics is light carpet. So you see again, as I explained before, exactly the same. So we at Zeus Micro Optics, we only do the micro lens array. We don't do the packaging. And this, in fact, this part here, oh, sorry. This part is then um, placed or fixed on the car just in front or behind the front wheel or under the, under the, the door. This, uh, this to have like a welcome light and it's uh, it's show uh, yeah, when you open the door. Here's some examples of typical on the left, typical light carpets you could see now actually on the in, in, in the street in the evening. And you can see there are some like small nice wings on each side of the car. Um, and also um, here, you, when you have a sliding door, it's like a carpet, a light carpet in front of you showing where you put the feet or you can also add some logos or brand name inside this light. Now, the future of that, <clears throat> it's to use this technology to, to also enhance the security, means you to show maybe to a bicycle or biker uh, that the car will turn on the left side. So you have like some projection on the, on the street of, the, of the, uh, the next movement or how the car will, uh, will, will change direction. Or also to, to, you see, to have some, um, some, some, some showing that the door is open such that you have uh, less accident. And now how freeform could help here, it's to uh, enhance the efficiency of course, to uh, <clears throat> to have also more functionality, functionality in this way that maybe you have some moving or uh, animation on the on, on the as a projection, and of course also to lower the cost, which is a very very important parameter for <clears throat> for this kind of component. Another product that uh, we are also working on at uh, Swiss Micro Optics is the headlights. You can see on the left a uh, classical or old way how to do headlamps. Um, it's very big, round. You don't have a lot of, um, uh, uh, how do you say, flexibility in the design. And now the trend is changing. We're going more and more. You can see also that on the, on, on the street, on the new cars, it's more and more like very thin or slim headlamps, lines. Some are horizontal, some are vertical. And of course, uh, I mean, this is also the new trend. And of course, here you cannot anymore use classical optics. You have to go with micro lenses array. And in fact, how this works, here is a, <clears throat> it was, already shown a little bit uh, in the previous talk. It's, um, it's a micro lens array. We can have high contrast because each micro lens, in fact, is kind of an individual projector. In this case, we have over 2,000 projectors in one element. And in fact, of, uh, in, and each projector has one channel with a different aperture. And in fact, by combining these different aperture, you can also have a kind of a grayscale effect uh, or projection. <clears throat> so, so again, here you can see we, we combine um, modular, slim, lightweight, and high contrast, high efficiency. Here's some example and also um, exploded view of this, of this kind of light, which is on a, actually built on a Lucid car. And uh, you can see here on the, on the bottom uh, the, the LEDs, here the condenser lens, uh, 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 yeah, condenser lens, and then here the micro lens array, and the, the whole package is is shown here or here on the on the right. 
Now, <clears throat> I'd like to show you an example that was made uh, with Freeform and in collaboration. I mean, it's a new concept made by Hella. And uh, they tried to, to, in fact, get rid of this collimation lens and the aperture here. Here is the, as I showed you before, it's the <clears throat> what we are actually doing. You have uh, the two micro lens arrays and here in the middle, <clears throat> The, the aperture. The concept of, uh, of Hella and is to, to have a, 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 how do you say, a free form structures. Here is a kind of facet structures, which in one side do the collimation directly from the light coming from the LED. And on the front side, it's the illumination doing uh, the, this, this, uh, this um, beam shape that's in this example, it's a uh, it's uh, for a uh, low light uh, beam uh, headlight. <clears throat> and the good, I mean, the, the advantage here, it's really that you get you get rid of two elements. First, the collimation lens, which is still a little bigger, a big element in, the, in this construction. And of course, the aperture, which also have or give, bring some losses when you, you take the whole systems. Then we are also working on the interior projection. And here, I mean, the, um, the big challenge is that we have curved surface or we want different, <clears throat> different type of lights also, or sometimes it's very slim in some places. Some it's like here, we want something curved. Uh, and we, we uh, in some cases, we also want to project um, some, some design or some, some, uh, yeah, some designs on, it, on that. And here it's really, I mean, to summarize this slide, summarize it. We don't have any more like for the light carpet, a flat road or flat street, uh, which is a screen we can be seen. This time we have like a curved surface. And here we are also looking or working on using this kind of uh, a device to have this correct projection that when you look at it, you have not something distorted. And maybe as last example, this was also made uh, inside a fabulous project, <clears throat> this time in collaboration with uh, UPMT, who made the master. We here made uh, special structures we, without, I mean, we call it zero curvature structures. A zero curvature structures means we, in this case, we have a radius of curvature which is infinite. And here you can see the equation of the aspheric lens equation. And by putting this uh, radius of curvature infinite, in fact, this term usually describing the lens shape, classical lens shape, uh, disappear because then it's, uh, it's zero. And we just described the surface with this polynomial effect. And then you can have this how do you say kind of, I call it, I know it's maybe wrong, but like donut form shape lens. Um, here you can see the, the, the master, here's some replication we made out of it. And we use that now because this is also an important um, um, things to, to get in control. It's to control the whole, I mean, during the fabrication, when you do in, uh, the imprint, you also pass through different stages until you have the, the tool, the imprinting tool to make the final imprint. And of course, by doing all these stages, you have some shrinkage, some deformation and this, and we, to understand how this happened, why this happened, and what is really the, the kind of physics happening behind and how to compensate that to not do too many, how do you say, trials. Uh, <clears throat> we, we try to, to build up now at SUS some models to, to describe this shrinkage. Here you have, uh, for example, two measurements. One is the master, the imprint, and here is the difference. And you can see some deformation due to the, the neighbor lens, or also here you can see some deformation. And I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Then before to, to take the question, I would like just to, to ask you to, to precise a little bit more how you are involved in Fabulous and how you, you are able to, to support uh, companies which would like to, to candidate to, to the project. What is your role? 
yeah, in Fabulous, we are mainly um, doing the, what we call the imprint, I mean, the replication. I mean, uh, in this uh, typical case I showed with Hella, the mastering was made by, uh, by like, by UPMT or Power Photonics. Sorry, I didn't mention that before. And um, <clears throat> the design, of course, is made when you begin, the design is made by Hella. Then the mastering is made by UPMT and uh, <clears throat> Power Photonics in this case, and we are then doing the replication directly on the on the glass. I mean, we we are kind of producing the prototypes or the final parts then to, to be used. Of course, we for that we use, um, I mean, it's not um, uh, exotic uh, production steps. It's really what we use in production, in our production for automotive now. Same type of materials, same type of wafer, same type of, uh, of uh, yeah processes. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the precision, Mark. And we have a question from uh, Mohamed Zaidi from Automotive Lighting. Mohamed, if you want to ask your question by yourself. Hello. Hello. Uh, thanks for great presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm Zaidi. I'm uh, uh, the lighting senior manager from the one a startup company which I can uh, disclose since we still uh, the background still on working but I have a few uh, one question I think is quite important to know I'm quite interested on the macron lens uh, but uh, uh, I I just want to know uh, what is the the lead time to develop a new macro lens because uh, for for a startup company the, the 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 most important thing is to bring the car as soon as possible uh, to meet the the very uh, I think uh, tight timeline. That's why I, uh, I just want to know. This is uh, my first question, and then the second question is uh, any is any uh, micro lens that we can use for the for the just a uh, just a, a quick. Uh, quick uh, without any uh, long development times only two questions from my side mm -hmm. i mean the first question concerning the lead time this is a little bit difficult to to answer you directly uh, like this because it uh, first it will strongly depends on the on the on the mastering in fact now how long it will take to to uh, to have a master because for uh, i mean again it depends if you want um, now I, I call it master now, but maybe if you just want, I mean, just a lens which is hatched into the glass, then it's a different way. And here, I think we, we I cannot give you exactly the lead time because it will depend the shape, the size, the number of lenses, the materials. Sometimes you need to, to order some substrate you like to have. Some are very exotic, some are not, or less. <clears throat> And then what I showed in the automotive, we are using what we call the imprint technology, it means this really begins with a, a mastering, it means that we have to order it internally by reflow or give it externally, like uh, as I mentioned, um, UPMT, which will do the first master and then they will engrave it or we'll do by reflow. And then once we have this master, and this can also be from uh, several weeks, in fact, to have it. Then we need again several weeks to do the what we call the imprinting tool. I mean, depending the materials we use, depending the glass, and so we we need also the or I mean the the orientation of if it's a positive or a negative master, and you want a positive or a negative lens. Let me say we need to do kind of a replication, replication of replication until we have. With the correct materials, we use a, a soft stamp material to do the replication the, in the right shape. And then if it's a brand new product, then we need to, I mean, the, then we do some metrology also. And you will, I think you will come with a design with some specification. And then of course we have to see if we are then in the specification and if as i mentioned with the last slide which is very important to know all this shrinkage happening in the different materials you use we can see if we can correct it or if we need to do 
um, a new mastering at the, at the, and then of course you you have a, a, again a loop in fact of of doing all that. Of course, once a product is running, we are much faster than in the way that um, uh, that we already know what kind of correction we need to uh, to bring to the to the to the to the master beginning in fact to the master. And the second question, I know because I'm at SUS since at least one year now, and before I was working with, a for, uh, with I mean, I was using SUS as a supplier, and they had in before some lenses on the shelf, but I don't see that anymore. But um, I mean, you maybe send me your requirements and I can see internally if we can find something uh, that you we can be satisfied with. Thank you, Mohamed, for your question. Is this okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And we have another uh, question. Uh, yeah, so my, my question. Yeah. Okay. And what, another question from Mohamed Rafatou from the Polsura Institute. Mohamed, if you want to, to ask your question by yourself. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the nice oh. talk. Uh, actually, I would like to know, like, at the imprinting process, like, what is the maximum glass substrate you are using for imprinting at a one time? The maximum thickness, you mean, or no maximum glass? Like, it's four inch or six inch glass wafer. Uh, or... Actually, we all the whole production is on eight inch. I mean, two hundred millimeters, if you okay. want to be correct. <clears throat> okay, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you are getting the master from you mentioned UPT. Uh... Depends. This is an example in Fabulous. We okay. have that, and uh, but we have different. In fact, um, master supply. We also do in some cases internally for some uh, some uh, some products. Okay, so typically, like after getting the uh, designed master, like how many times you can use for replication using one master? Like typical I mean, time. Um, that's that's the the trick a little bit. We never uh, use the master for direct replication on a product. This okay. is for me something we treasure, like uh, we put it in a safe. So mm -hmm. what we do, in fact, we have a whole sequence. From the master, we do a copy. And then, of course, you have uh, the inverse uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the, the shape. Then you, we really need to do a copy. And depending how the master is, we, we have to do that two or three times. I mean, copy of copy. And then when we have a kind of what we call also submaster, <clears throat> Then we do what stems, and we do stems this many times from this uh, this uh, submaster, and with one of our stems, we I think we can do around hundred replication, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Good to know. Depending the materials, depending again, this is it's a, quite a rough number. I mean, don't take it very. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, I just would like to know, like, uh, what is a typical mm -hmm. number, like? You, uh, you see that it's successful or the master is good, mm -hmm. like the number, like in terms yeah. of the uh, like business or something. So in that point of view, I'm just asking like, mm -hmm. yeah, after finalizing any design, like if like sort of product launch or something, yeah, yeah. what is that typical mm -hmm. number? Like yeah. you usually say that's the good part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, this is the not from the master, it's from the sub master. So, mm -hmm. and then again, you can do about hundred or even more uh, so a replication from the sub master. And if the sub master is done, we can begin again from the beginning. I mean, this is the, so we don't need, a lot of masters, in fact. If once we have a good one, we really treasure it and keep it, and to, you have then a kind of whole uh, in, uh, family below, in fact, that we build up with this master. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Thank you, Mohamed, for, for the question. Thanks a lot, uh, Mark, from Sus Microptic for the presentation. Can you maybe stop sharing your screen? And Mohamed, I invite you to stay uh, at the end of this workshop for the networking and uh, Q&A session, if you have some question about Fabulous. Um, and now we welcome Nolan Chan from Fazix. And we'll talk about metrology systems. Nolan? Yes. Please, the Thank floor you. is yours. You should see my screen now. Yeah, you can start. <clears throat> so thanks for the introduction. So I'm Nolan Chan. I'll be presenting uh, Fazix solutions uh, for uh, automotive applications uh, in general involving, of course, uh, micro optics. So I start with um, some information about the company then I will explain which technology we're using uh, and also of course what we're doing. 
So Phasex, uh, we're a French company that was created about 10 years ago. Um, we're uh, about 40 and our main focus is designing and providing uh, high resolution wavefront measurement solutions from uh, DPUV, 190 nanometers, to long wave infrared, 14 microns. All our products are based on one technology that is called quadri-wave metrosharing interferometry. And uh, we can see some examples here. So our solutions range from the wavefront sensor, so the core of all of our products that integrates our technology. And then from that, we have different levels of integrations. So it can be either uh, accessories that you combine with the sensor in order to adjust uh, the beam uh, to the sample you're testing. So for example, if you want to characterize the surface in double pass, uh, you can either send uh, an animated beam with a given size. So with a given set of different expanders that we can see here, or we can also create point sources if your uh, uh, surface is convex or, or concave. And then uh, the next level is also possible. So we have more complete uh, solutions. So we have standard uh, solutions examples here, but we can also make custom benches. So here we have a typical interferometer, but that is still using <coughs> our sensor and technology inside, which grants us the uh, possibility to have a large dynamic range because we're using a wavefront sensor, but also the possibility to work at uh, different wavelengths, for example. So here we have in these two solutions up to eight, eight different wavelengths to work with really the functional uh, wavelengths of the device that you're using. And on and the last one, we have here an example of um, complete, auto, completely automatic uh, lens testing machine, where basically you want to put in your objective or your sample. And from that, we have all information regarding uh, uh, the EFL wavefront or um, Zenic aberrations. So <clears throat> to go back to the technology a bit, we are making a wavefront sensor. So a wavefront sensor in general is a combination of uh, two components. One, of course, is a detector, which can be of different technologies. And another one that is an optical component that can be for a Hartmann sensor, a matrix, or an array of pinholes. For a Shack Hartmann sensor, an array of micro lenses. Or for us, uh, the component is a diffraction grading. So how it works is that when we send in uh, the light from uh, outside, then we, we go through the diffraction grading first that will diffract the beam into four replicas, which are the first orders of diffraction along the X and Y axis. And on the detector, we then have the sum of these four orders. Actually, it is designed so that there's only a few millimeters between the diffraction grading and the detector, and the different orders of diffraction are sheared by an amount so that uh, on the sensor, all the replicas sum each other, sum with each other on the same area. So we see here then a matrix or an array of spots which correspond to the interference pattern. So it is in fact a 2D sign function. And what we're doing is actually we're working in the Fourier space and we're studying the modulation of frequency around the harmonics. So we can here see here a typical diffraction pattern. So we have the harmonics in X and Y and the symmetries. And what we're doing is that from the modulation, so the intensity distribution around the harmonics in X and the first harmonics in Y, we retrieve the phase gradient. And from the phase gradient, we retrieve the phase map. In addition to that, <clears throat> we can also have the intensity information from the middle. So <clears throat> this technology has several advantages uh, compared to a regular um, phase measurement solutions, which would be, for example, FISO interferometers or Hartmann sensors which are the typical large dynamic range. But on top of that, we have a solution that can work with any polarizing, uh, polarizing devices because we are insensitive to polarization. So we can also perform birefringence studies. Um, we work with different wavelengths. Actually, the <clears throat> technology is by nature uh, achromatic. So you can really have the, and study the effect of different wavelengths on your component or on your system. Of course, it is uh, not sensitive to vibrations. This is mainly due to the fact that the interferences are only created on a few millimeters, so that you can really work in any kind of environment. It could be a manufacturing floor, a factory. So we use this technology <clears throat> in three main domains. <clears throat> so the first one is 
uh, laser or related to sources characterization. The second one is focused more on optics, uh, components and systems uh, characterization. And the last one is imaging, which is uh, globally using the system more for biology in general. So the idea here is uh, in automotive, we use the sensor uh, for laser testing in LiDAR, for example, when we they want to characterize um, the beam with or without a collimator, with or without an array of micro lenses. We can characterize different types of LiDARs, which could be solid state uh, lasers, but also vexel, vexel arrays. So we have also this flexibility. And all of these, the idea is to characterize the wave on air, the density aberration, but also the divergence, which can be critical when you want to uh, map the environment for autonomous cars applications, for example. <clears throat> so in optics, we can see here different examples either components, which would be, for example, um, a lens, uh, an array of lenses. These here are green lenses, but they could be any other kind of lenses. It is important to know that we work with uh, the face. So we have also a lot of experience with metasurfaces. Uh, at component level, we can also work with surface testing. So this is used, for example, for testing masters or master shapes. And we can also perform measurements of both. So we can uh, iterate between the characterization of the component that is produced and uh, the, the master surface. So uh, more on the system level, we work with <clears throat> different kinds of um, optical components, or optical systems. So as I mentioned, we have a system that can characterize all uh, objective lenses, even for high C rays, which is a specificity of, of our device. We can also work with uh, optics that are uh, not really optics, like windshields, um, where they want to characterize typically the impact of the windshield of, or, of, or of a window on uh, a lighter beam or an ADS camera, or even headlamps. And we can also characterize uh, non-imaging devices, uh, mainly due to the fact that we measure away from uh, and not uh, really an image. Uh, just to give an example of a characterization of uh, micro optics. So here I put an example of the green lens, but as I mentioned, it could be uh, anything that modulates the light. So the thing that I want to show is really we can play with two different aspects of the characterization. One is looking at the structures or the refractive index profile as we measure the optical path difference. It could be either the refractive index or the thickness or, the, or both. And we can also characterize the optical function. So it means that we can see the component as uh, actually an imaging device, yeah, an imaging lens. So <clears throat> how it works is that on a green lens, you have a gradient of index of refraction that creates a mirage effect, which then creates a focusing spot, a focusing plane. So <clears throat> we typically want to characterize the uh, curvature profile in order to retrieve the effective focal lens of this device. So to do that, <clears throat> on the first aspect, as I mentioned, to characterize the refractive index, um, we use the fact that we measure the optical path difference, which is corresponding roughly to the uh, factor of the refractive index, the, uh, the gradient of index of refraction times the thickness. And to do that, we just need the wavefront sensor coupled with an imaging device, which can be uh, either a relay or a microscope objective, for example. And from that, we can directly deduce as a direct measurement <clears throat> the uh, profile of the OPD. And from the OPD profile, we deduce the refractive index profile. On this curve, what you see uh, typically the actual measurement in white and a fitting with a perfect uh, parabola, actually, which would be a perfect defocus since it should be a perfect lens. And then we can see the difference between both. So you can read it. You can see here that uh, you have a typical difference in curvature in the same direction. And you can see here something that looks like the, the donut shape that was mentioned before. And um, there is typically the difference between both that look like spherical aberration. We have here some information about the precision and the resolution that we have on this kind of measurements. So this is for the first aspect. So we can really perform a direct measurement of either the structure shape of the or the refractive index on the component. And then we can also characterize it as a regular lens. So to do that, the idea is that because we're using uh, this QWLSI technology, we can perform a measurement without really optics. We don't need to have a collimated beam on the wavefront sensor, which is quite convenient in order to make sure that we don't add any aberrations to the measurement. 
So <clears throat> by doing that, we just play the wavefront sensor so that we optimize the number of measurement points on the sensor, so to optimize the size. And from there, what we typically have is the phase map that we can see here, and we can recognize some spherical aberrations on both. And we can also uh, have, because we have the intensity, we can also have the MTF, so as regular lenses would give. So <clears throat> in conclusion, we have um, a device that can really provide the wavefront sensor in transmission and reflection. So this only depends on the setup that you use, So the sensor will always do its work and provide the wavefront error. From that, you have the Zanity aberrations. Because it's achromatic, you can work with different coatings, with different substrates, with different um, components or systems. You can also work with uh, polarization if you want to study injection-related effects or, or defects. Uh, this is also possible. Um, we have several um, solutions to do that. So either away from sensor or custom systems or complete uh, solutions or even intermediate modular solutions if you want to play with different kinds of a system by yourself. And uh, as I mentioned, so we work <clears throat> with automotive applications. We also have a strong expertise in augmented and virtual reality applications. And um, we can work with really any um, phase profiles as we work with metasurfaces, which can create vortices or other arbitrary uh, phase profiles. So thanks uh, for your attention. Of course, if you have any question, I'd be glad to, to answer it. At the end, discuss if you have any samples that you'd like to, to characterize, also be glad to discuss. Thank you, Nolan. Thanks a lot for your, your presentation. And we have uh, already one question from uh, Daniela Cartos from Hela. Daniela, if you want to ask your yes. question, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, so very interesting uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'd like to know if there's any limit concerning the curvature of the wavefront or when we look, for example, on the measurements of diverging beams, if there's a limit of the yeah, inclining or incoming angle of the light with regard to the sensor? So it depends. Uh, if you want to characterize directly uh, the lengths, we typically work with um, f over 1. So this gives you roughly the, the angle. Um, but in general, what will happen is uh, it's mostly a challenge for the um, imaging uh, device that you, that you may need to put. So if you want to do a perfect uh, direct measurement, the typical sensor without any customization can work with uh, f over one, which we can go higher if, uh, if necessary. Okay, okay. But it's it's a good first uh, value. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Daniela, for our question. Um, and Nolan, how are you today uh, able to work in the automotive industry on production line, for example? Is it something that you're already doing? Yes, yes, we work in production lines, uh, but not of micro optics, <laughs> no. but, um Actually, I, I cannot really disclose in, in which uh, areas, but uh, sure. we work mostly for autonomous cars related uh, applications at the moment. Okay. Thank you. So thanks again, Nolan, for our presentation. Really interesting. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you. Now we can welcome Marcel Siller from uh, Glowing. Marcel, if you want to share your, your presentation and start. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so just a second. All right. Um, um, here we go. So you should be able to see my screen. Full screen. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So again, good morning from our side from glowing here in Leipzig, uh, Germany. Um, my talk will be about a um, yeah, brand new technology based on micro optics. Um, and the title is MLA meets DLP to create what we call DMLA. So digital micro lens array projectors, a new chance to have super compact digital MLA projectors in the future. Um, just some words about my person. So I have um, a strong automotive background coming from, from Porsche when I was still a student then working for Fraunhofer. Um, being there, um, I was one of the two inventors for the uh, projector MLA that we that we saw today at uh, ASUS uh, presentations. Then uh, went to BMW and introduced the um, so-called light carpet in the seven series uh, in 2015. Uh, went to California, being there at Lucid Motors, uh, did the micro optical headlight there, 
And uh, then coming back to Germany, um, I finally um, yeah, founded my own company along with my wife. Um, um, yeah, so um, our company is named Glowing. We founded in uh, 2019 and we are mainly focused on MLA projector modules uh, with much more output than the, um, I would say, the mass produced uh, modules you see in the market today uh, in the OEM um, cars. So we are a licensed MLA technology provider, um, MLA consultant, of course, and uh, we do our own modules, as you can see in the right hand uh, corner here. And um, yes, of course, we use freeform micro optics um, to get the image on the screen or get the image on the street. So um, what's the main principle? I, I don't think I, I have to uh, go too deep uh, in here. Um, the, the, the basic principle is just a, or um, is a superimposing of uh, several uh, hundreds, uh, typically in light carpet case, 150 channels. And uh, by having that, um, you get a very, very slim system compared to a standard projector. Um, so you get bright and sharp images due to the high depth of focus. And just as a rule of thumb, uh, just imagine you have uh, 10 by 10, uh, channels in one MLA. So um, with 100 channels in total, you end up with about 10% of the thickness uh, that would be required for a standard projector, single channel projector with the same flux. So um, of course, you know the light carpet. We've seen that, that image before. Um, there is, an, it's not only for a design purpose, it's also for a safety purpose, um, as Mark Schnieper already, already mentioned. Um, if someone tries to open the door and there is someone coming from behind, a um, pedestrian or a bicyclist or a, um, another car, um, the, the function of the light carpet is activated before the door is opened in um, uh, full. And, and so there is some time available um, as, a, as a warning. So the, the, the number of uh, accidents for these so-called dooring accidents um, can be lowered. With, uh, with our product. Um, here you have a short overview of our current product um, on the left-hand side. Our current module produces about 90 lumens from 40 cubic centimeters and five watts um, power consumption. And on the right-hand side, you see our very, very soon coming new module with um, yeah, like three times the lumen output from the current module while being smaller. So, um, the main topic of today's talk will be uh, the, let's say, um, the marriage of MLA idea with digital projection and uh, digital projection, meaning DLP, te Texas Instruments DLP technology. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, it is based on uh, an array of very, very small mirrors in the range of a couple of microns. And they have, let's say, two, uh, two state status. Uh, the one state is for the, the, the on state is for um, projecting uh, the light. So there is incoming light that is deflected uh, for on state into the pupil of the objective and for off state into an absorber. And if you have a look at a system layout of such a projector, it gets pretty complicated pretty fast. So you need a lot of elements for the illumination path then you need some kind of a combiner. Um, you have the DMD chip itself, and then you have um, a projection lens uh, containing a multitude of lenses, like five, five or six lenses to get the image on the screen. So what we do now and what we want to propose is a free form micro optical approach um, that can combine best of both worlds. And in, in principle, um, it sounds pretty easy, um, we use a single channel. So if you have a look at this part of the, of the optics, so you have the um, DMD over here or some area of DMD over here and the micro lens over there. In principle, every micro lens has a twin neighbor. And this neighbor is identical, of course, and it has two functions. So if you have a look at the center lens here, it has one function to illuminate the neighbor DMD area of this lens and at the same time, it has the function to Im imagine, um, uh, to image, sorry, to image this area over here to the screen. 
So with this, with, with this uh, boundary in the optical design, it is possible to generate a system, something like that, that only consists of a single LED, a single collimating optics, then those two prisms, for instance, if you want to get pretty compact, um, and then a, two, a stack of two micro lens arrays. This is the cover glass of the DMD and one DMD. And in principle, that's it. And uh, if you compare such a layout with a, um, with the, um, let's say, a standard layout of a current DMD system that, that needs like 15 elements, you only end up with like five elements. And you end up with about half of the um, volume of the optical engine. And at the same time, you are able to increase the flux. The only price you have to pay is uh, the resolution in the image. Um, if you are using a uh, super resolution, which is possible in this um, um, multi-aperture um, approach, you can, you can get to almost the same uh, resolution like a standard approach, as you can see over here. So um, yeah, here, here you see some screenshots from uh, coming from, from ZMAX and non-sequential. So you can see it's uh, uh, in the virtual world, it's, it's already working. So you have the DMD, you have the stack of the two micro lens arrays, the, the, the glass prisms over here, one collimator. And um, yeah, we get a pretty nice image that is fully digital controllable. And um, having a look at the, at the MLA, as you can see, it's not that easy. It's not a reef, reflow, um, reflow lens anymore. As in light carpet case, it's, it gets pretty complicated when it comes to the tooling of such a part. Um, but in principle, it's not uh, out of this world. And, and hopefully, um, yeah, we can find a, um, some, some kind of a nice supply chain in the future to get that into the, the headlights of the future or into the ground digital ground projectors of the future, uh, as it was done for the, I would say, analog MLA like 10 years ago or even more, 14 years ago. So um, just to have one example, this is the, the, the current headlight uh, from, from Audi. And as you can see, the optical engine needs a, a lot of space over here to generate a low beam distribution. So here's the DMD. Uh, in this case, there are no prisms um, for splitting the illumination and projection light path. So there's only one mirror, one LED that is collimated. And um, yeah, some pretty one, two, three um, bulky, bulky lenses to, uh, to focus the, the imager on the, on the street. And if you take an MLA, you would, be, you would end up with a volume um, that would be required. It would be like this green outline. So you would save a lot of space in your headlight. You would save a lot of weight and um, yeah, a lot of um, other benefits. So you end up with a smaller package size. You have less elements. You have lower bomb cost, a more robust system, since there are uh, not that many groups um, required to, to, get that, to get the function of the, of the projection. You end up with a high depth of focus, as we have seen it for the static image um, projector MLAs. So it can be used for ground projection where you have a sm very small angle of incidence. Um, you have a very nice feature since you can digitally refocus. So um, since you have a digital uh, spatial light modulator, you can control the convergence of all the single channels with respect to each other. And so you can tune the distance where all those images uh, superimpose. Um, another big advantage, you can integrate your LED homogenization. Since there is a uh, redundancy on the screen, you always uh, have some kind of mixing that is inherent. So you don't need um, homogenization in your illumination light path, or uh, you don't need, um, let's say, RGB time sequential illumination. You could do it by a spatial uh, color filters, for instance. Of course, there are some cons. Without uh, higher, let's say, image calculation algorithms, you would end up with lower screen resolution. But in some applications, this is not a, a particular like it is for, for instance, for a headlight. You don't need full HD for a, for a, for a good headlight. And of course, it would not be free since we have the IP for this, uh, for this approach. Um, if you have a, a look at the, the total scaling of an, an MLA or often DMLA compared to a standard DMD projector, you can jump 
from, let's say, this line. This is uh, the, the etendue uh, limit of a standard projector. You can jump. So this is the volume. X axis is the volume. You can jump to much lower um, uh, volumes, uh, system volumes. So you can jump from the gray zone into the green zone. Uh, and depending on the number of channels that you want to that you want to have, so let's say for reasonable use cases, something like like twenty channels or something like that is um, uh, is possible. Um, you end up somewhere around fifty percent of the of the volume that is required for the same kind of uh, optical optical function. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for your for your time. Uh, we would be very, um, yeah, uh, very happy to cooperate in the in, in the fabulous uh, project uh, in the future, um, and yeah, and get that get that idea on the street as as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcel, for your presentation. Really, You're really welcome. impressive. Uh, I have two questions for you. First one is, um, are you able to to use your your system during the daylight? And if yes, uh, how do you manage it? And the second one is, um, what is the distance you are able to illuminate with, with such system? First, first question was about the luminance we can, we can get, right? Yeah, it was about if you were able to use this system during the daylight. During the daylight. Well, yeah. it always depends uh, on, the, uh, on, 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 the, on, on the flux, let's say, or, or on, on the distance that you, that you have from your projector to the screen. If this is, um, let's say, used for a crown projection, where you have like half a meter distance to the street up to four meters, like you see it in this picture over here. Um, the image would, or let's say for our current projectors, the image is still visible uh, at, at daylight, or let's say if it's a cloudy daylight, you see the first half of a meter already, already there. Mm -hmm. And the darker it gets, the more of the image uh, will, will be added to the, to the image. For so the DMLA case, it, it, well, in the end, it depends on the, on the size of the DMD we can use. On the attendue we can use, um, or on the chip size of the LED we can use, um, a headlight does not have to be visible at, at the day, daytime. But if you use it for a short uh, throw projection or something like that, it will be visible if you have, let's say, 300 lumens and only yeah. like half a meter distance, the image is visible. OK, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Sorry, and second question was about the, the distance. The, it, was, it was related because it was about the distance you were yeah. able to, to well, eliminate. It's, it's so. flexible. It's flexible. Since, since we use micro lenses, the micro lenses are working hyperfocal. So let's say from a distance of about 20 centimeters up to infinity, they are always in focus. And the distance you want to project, you can control only by digital uh, manipulation of your image content of the DMD. Mm -hmm. So this is yeah. pretty. This is pretty um, flexible. So you can have a, a let's say um, a carryover part for all of your customers. So if you if there's a tier one um, that let's say creates a uh, DMLA ground projector module uh, in the future, um, it's pretty flexible. Yeah, you can use for it sure. for larger distances or lower distances without without the need for mechanically moving parts. Mm. Thank you, Marcel, for your answer. Okay. okay, so um, thanks again, Marcel, for your presentation. Thanks right. a lot. And uh, we can welcome now Hagen Schwitzer from Dr. Optics. Hagen, if you want to share your presentation and start your, your talk. Just one moment. Yeah. Okay, I'm missing the sharing button, just a moment. So. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Hagen Schweizer of uh, Dr. Optics uh, in, in Germany. I like to talk about near field uh, daylight projection uh, based on a holographic uh, light modulator. So actually, application is, is comparable to the previous uh, case. I like to start with an introduction. Uh, as we could see already in the previous uh, presentation, near field or ground projection means projecting a light in a relative short distance uh, to a car. 
And uh, yeah, this projection can be done just on, on one side of the car, but it can be also done 360 degrees around uh, the car. And just to give you uh, some examples, uh, it's possible to display information or to communicate with other cars or traffic users. For example, we can just show information for pedestrians. Uh, it's possible uh, to project some probably also invisible information to communicate with other cars. Uh, it's possible to project warning messages for pedestrians or cyclists. Uh, it's possible, for example, in uh, at the, or below the trunk to project uh, a pattern and symbol and footprint that shows the position for hands-free trunk release. Um, it, I think standard already or for in, available in several cars is a uh, projection of logos, of advertisements, of animations. I think this is what several cars already have, for example, in the so-called pedal lamp in the side uh, mirror or at different uh, positions uh, at the side of the car. And at the end, uh, safety information is also of interest, for example, turn indicators, extended stop lights, and so on. So there are much more applications, but we have three different uh, 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 main applications, information, communication, welcome information, and safety. So, and uh, typical current uh, ground projection systems, current ground, uh, ground uh, projection systems are typically used for or made from nighttime or tree light conditions. Uh, it's uh, typically challenging uh, during daylight. And here the goal is to make it available also for daylight conditions with the background that it can be helpful for autonomous driving. That, that means the safety reason and the communication with other traffic users, with pedestrians and cyclists, this is of importance uh, for autonomous driving. And here, let's say our, our rough guess is we need around 3000 looks at the projection uh, plane. This is just a rough estimate. Uh, I, I will tell you later how the projector works. And depending on the image that you uh, have, the, the, the illuminance uh, will vary. So how uh, is, uh, what's the position of the projectors around the car? So we are planning to have 12 projectors around the car to allow this 360 degree uh, ground uh, projection. And the projectors should be mounted at the sill of the car. The, uh, I'd like to show you some sketches of the projection setup. So here, this is, this is the car. And we will project in a very low angle of 22 degrees uh, to the ground uh, surface. And uh, the projection plane is or has a size of 1 meters uh, by 0 0.3 meters. And actually, this projection plane is divided in four subregions. So we have four different projection channels for each projector. So, and uh, these are some, some 3D models of the projector. So here, this, this gray box, this is the, the, something like the light fan that comes out of the projector. And this is a 3D model of the projector. And, what you see here is already this uh, four gray boxes. These are the light sources. And I will explain a little bit more in detail in the following, what is the optical setup? What is, is the concept of this uh, projector? So this is a uh, sketch of the optical setup. And we use four different light sources and to reach uh, or to have a high light power in at the projection plane, we use four multi-mode diode lasers. Uh, with a uh, light power of uh, an optical light power of, of one watt each. So we have four different projection channels with four diode lasers. So behind these diode lasers uh, uh, are collimation lenses. So we have four different collimation lenses. And we have here for other lenses, we call it field lenses, which are used to extend the field of view at the projection plane. So and important is here for this application, we use for the image generation an ELCOS-based uh, holographic spatial light modulator made by the company HoloEye. And uh, you can imagine that this light modulator will not introduce the real image. It does not generate an intensity modulation. It does not absorb light. It introduces a phase modulation into the incident laser beams. 
That means, uh, phase modulation means we introduce locally per pixel and small uh, delay uh, to the incident laser light. And uh, this phase modulation that appears or that is generated by this uh, modulator creates by diffraction at the projection plane and desired light pattern. So this is not an imaging approach, more an diffraction or holographic-like approach. So, and we have four uh, projection channels and all projection channels are modulated by a single spatialite modulator. So the modulator surface is split in four uh, parts and modulates in parallel all projection channels. So how does this work? So we can imagine uh, that we have, and call it, uh, I like to call it a beam optics. That means we have collimation lenses, probably additional lenses and these lenses are used to collimate the laser beam and to generate in the target plane in narrow spot. So and now we add a spatial light modulator, and this is a very simplified sketch. That means here the, the spatial light modulator is shown in transmission, but in real world it is working in reflection. But the concept is the same. So the spatial light modulator is added to this lens optics to replicate and deflect the spot at different positions. So the, the modulator is not absorbing light to generate a light pattern. It is uh, using diffraction effects to deflect uh, the light to different positions. And uh, it means uh, the brightness of the different points of lines of the image depends uh, on the uh, yeah, on the surface or of the uh, yeah, on the illuminated part of this projection plane. The smaller the number of points and lines, the higher is the brightness of these lines. If we illuminate very homogeneous and large surface, we have a lower brightness. So, and we can computer optimize this phase function of the spatial light modulator. This is see what you see here on the left. So every a uh, local point is one pixel of the modulator. And uh, this leads by diffraction, for example, here to the doctor optics uh, script in a sufficient large distance. So I like to show you a uh, technology demonstrator of this uh, projector. So this is not a uh, projector for the CS production. It is uh, for testing purposes. And uh, you see here in coin to uh, see in comparison the size of the projector. And here, this is the, the assembled projector with laser light switched on. So this projector was made for green laser light. And um, yeah, if we send to this projector a holographic light pattern on phase modulation, as I showed before, then we will get in the lab uh, here the doctor optic script at the ground uh, surface. Uh, you can actually already see that there are some geometrical deformations. Uh, and this is, becomes more clear if I uh, project instead of the Dr. Optics logo and, and grid pattern here on the left, the Dr. Optics logo is just projected in a single channel out of these four channels. And here the grid lines are projected in two channels. And we can clearly see this geometrical deformation that comes from the relative low projection angles uh, and the uh, uh, the, this relative low angle between the projector axis and the ground surface and relative large angles uh, of the projector. But uh, the good point is distortions can be compensated by software. So uh, we can recompensate during the calculation of this uh, phase function, these geometrical distortions. I just like to say very short some words about the uh, optimization of this uh, phase function. This is done by the iterative Fourier transform algorithm, which is known by digital holography and diffractive optics. And um, this means this algorithm analyzes the full optical system, calculates the light distribution in the target plane. It applies some constraints. This means we see typically during one iterations that the light distribution in the target plane is not this light distribution that we like to have. This light distribution is corrected. There is a modified light distribution created, which is back propagated into the plane of the modulator. And the modulator typically can just generate a modulation function that only modulates the phase. It cannot modulate the intensity. And so we have additional constraints. We again correct this modulation function so that it is phase only. And then we 
repeat this loop and after several loops we get in phase modulation which uh, creates the desired light pattern. So I like to mention that this uh, um, projector is developed and also tested within a public research project uh, supported by the German government. This project is called MAMEC. It means in English something like machine human communication. And we are uh, within the, the B part of this project. And here project partners are HoloEye, the Fraunhofer Institute of uh, Applied Optics and Precision Engineering from Jena, which this institute is also, uh, we have also two co-authors from this institute here for this presentation. And um, Dr. Optics is also part of this uh, project, especially for the assembly of this module. And these projectors will be finally mounted uh, in a car by Audi. This is a part of Audi, and it will be tested under different conditions. So I like to summarize and like to give an outlook. So I sh uh, showed you, I explained 360 near field or cone projection enables display of information. Uh, it enables communication to traffic users. Uh, it can increase safety. And daylight projection is especially of interest uh, to display safety information, for example, for autonomous driving. And uh, I showed you and casualty demonstrator, which is working uh, based on holographic projection uh, using and spatial light modulator and four diode lasers, in this case, four green diode lasers. Uh, I mentioned uh, since the spatial light modulator deflects the light, not only uh, not absorbs the light, uh, the, the brightness depends on the, uh, yeah, on the shape of the logos. It is possible to show animated logo, so it's a dynamic light projection. And um, I think the current brightness is not sufficient for a bright sunlight uh, or bright sunny day, but uh, under, let's say, cloudy conditions, it is uh, the logos are visible. Um, but there are some future steps which should be done. Uh, it is required to test this uh, setup on a real car. Um, it is required to extend it to different colors. We have currently green colors. You could see in the beginning, uh, beginning for some projectors, we need probably a yellow or orange color or red, or maybe an RGB projection. And uh, what is always important in case, the case of laser projectors is to have a speckle reduction, which is currently excluded from this project, but this is something what uh, have to be done also in future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you again for, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and we have uh, two questions now. So the first one from Daniela Cartos. Hela. So Daniela, please. Yes, thank you very much. Again, an interesting uh, presentation here. Uh, so holography is one of uh, my personal uh, yeah, focus topics. Uh, and I would really like to know how you deal with other diffraction orders that are typically generated by the spatial light modulators. And what is the current efficiency? So if you are able to, to answer this question, of course, uh, what is about the efficiency that you currently can uh, get in the desired diffraction order? Yeah, so uh, since this spatial light modulator, this is, let's say, a modified LCOS display. So typical LCOS modulates the, the intensity. Here it modulates the phase. So it's a pixelated device. And so we get some diffraction at the pixels. And you can clearly see this, uh, that you get higher diffraction orders yeah, caused by these pixels or diffraction at the pixels. So this is light is currently blocked by just some apertures. and. Uh, I think this is responsible for the main energy losses that we have currently. So depending on the, so you can imagine uh, the LCOS can have uh, a limited uh, range or projection area. And if we fill completely this projection area uh, by a light pattern, then we can lose up to 50% of the light. If we use just a portion of this projection area, it is just around yeah, between five or 10%. So it varies quite strong, but this is the main loss. We have also some, let's say a little bit losses from uh, the phase function because we cannot deflect all light in the desired light pattern. We have also some stray light around. Yeah, so in a dark lab, you can see this, but this is maybe in the range of five, six, seven, eight percent depending on the pattern. 
Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Daniela, for your question. And um, another question from Marcel Silla from Glory. Marcel, please. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for having the, the chance. Uh, so, Mr. Mr. Schweitz, I was I was just wondering. Maybe maybe my question is a little conservative, but um, <laughs> do you have any plan, or did you discuss in in your project how how do you want to overcome the regulations when it comes to coherent light output on a car? I, I know that, that 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 discussion from let's say BMW laser headlight working there and so on, and it's a yeah. big issue. I think it's a critical point. Um, since this is currently just a demonstrator car yeah, for tests, uh, it's not the most important, but I think important in the future is um, you will have something like an exit window behind the projector. Yeah, and uh, the light power at this window is critical. So, and this is uh, the laser safety must be tested also in future. Yeah. And um, and must be checked so that let's say if any let's say a kid is looking into the projector that it has not an eye damage or that the projector switch off in this case, yeah. So it's in currently not the focus for this project, but here we would like to see how it works, how bright it is with different logos at different daylight conditions. But in future, it is required to check this and. Sure, also the prototype currently is not optimized concerning size or costs or anything else. Yeah, so this is not yet done. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Marcel. Thanks again for, for your answer. And another question from Lucas Hiller from Hela. Lucas, please, if you want to ask your question by yourself. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you're using some special iterative um, for year transform algorithms or you're just using the standard gauge back Saxon algorithms. So are you doing development on this too or using like standard um, no, calculations? Uh, we are using currently the standard one. So let's say for this current test car, it is just planned to have a limited number of pre-calculated uh, images. So this is, means it's not a real-time calculation of the images. We have some pre-calculated fixed images which can be changed to, to show different uh, yeah, logos in different situations. But in general, it would be possible uh, to extend this also to a dynamic display. That means to have a full movie or face function, but it would be also possible to make an example, in real time calculation of this face function in the graphics card. And this requires just, let's say, a simplified version of this iterative Fourier transform algorithm. So you, you don't need everything what you need, for example, to optimize in diffractive optical element. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Lucas, for the question. Thanks again, Hagen, for, for, for your presentation. Thanks a lot, really interesting. Thank you. So now our last speaker of this morning, of this workshop, last but not least. So we welcome um, Paul-Henri Mata from uh, Volvo Cars. Paul-Henri, are you yes, here? Yes, hello. Yes. Hello, everybody. Yeah. So I will share my screen. Yes. Yeah, so I have done a um, presentation about exterior lighting. So a general presentation just to, to know about what we talk and what could be the interest of, about the freeform optics. But I think we you talk a lot and in a lot of details today. So I think it will be uh, <laughs> something you, you already know, but we will see. Anyway, you can see uh, what are exterior lighting on a car. So you can see that we have a lot of components. We have a headlamp on the front, we have rear lamp, but also we have a lot of uh, small components uh, everywhere uh, on the car. And uh, about interior lighting, we have also a lot of LEDs everywhere in the car. So what are the stakes of the freeform optics? So what I think we have, um, we are interested in signaling function and lighting function. Uh, we talked this morning about lighting function especially, but also I think we need this uh, freeform optics for signaling function. And especially when we talk about signaling function, we talk about uh, uh, daytime running lamp, like um, the Tor Summer for Volvo, for example. So you can see this uh, image. And we talk about rear position light. And when we talk about this uh, signaling function, so what do we need? So first we need uh, to fulfill the legal requirement. So indeed we have to reach some candela values in different axes. So in the 
horizontal axis, so in, uh, in the zero, but also at 90 degrees, 45 degrees, uh, inboard, outboard, and so on. So it is quite complex to, to fulfill this legal requirement. But in the same time, we, we have some styling requests, especially now we focus with LEDs on a very good homogeneity. In the past, in the first development, it was a sporty LED, but now the trend is to have something very homogeneous. And also the third bullet is that we need to reduce the power consumption and we need to have a low power consumption for this sort of uh, design. And today, when we talk about signaling function, especially we have some uh, standard technology, which is reflector technology or which is a light guide and diffuser. And with this technology, what we know is that the efficiency is very poor. So with reflector technology, we know that the efficiency is around 50%. And with a light guide or diffuser, efficiency is about 10, 20%. So it is not really efficient. And if we compare, for example, for a daytime running lamp, the power consumption we have on some cars, so you can see that when you have bulbs, so it is on the left, the power consumption was around 50 watts per car. When you go to a spotty solution with LED reflector, for, the, for example, the power consumption was, uh, was reduced a lot between 10, 20 watts per car because we have a good optical efficiency. But when you go to light guide solution or multi-screen solution, or, you can see that the power consumption can be 30 watts, 60 watts or more and can be higher than with bulb because the optical efficiency of the system is very poor. And I just present a slide that uh, Varok presented, I think, uh, three years ago in a DVN meeting. And it is quite interesting because you can see on this slide uh, what is the optical efficiency of different system and what is the homogeneity you have of the system. And then when you have a light guide, which is quite spotty, so it is quite efficient, you can see, but homogeneity is very poor, so it is not enough. And then to increase the homogeneity, you have to, to add something. So you have the first solution, and all the car makers have done that in the past, you add some graining. And when you have some graining, so you will reduce the efficiency a bit, minus 20%, something like this, but, and you will increase the homogeneity. But the homogeneity, you can see, will not be perfect. And then you have to add some solution. So you can add some optical pillow optics in addition to the graining. So you will increase a bit the homogeneity. And then everybody focus on what we call the milky inner lens. So it is what we use, in especially the DF23 for, from Evonik or Rome now. And this uh, milky lens is very good for homogeneity, but it is a disaster for efficiency. And also the main drawbacks we have is that it is not allowed in US because we have an ACE requirement in the US regulation and we cannot use this milky inner lens. And then comes the micro optic solution. You can see with the micro optic solution, so it is just simulation. So it depends what, uh, uh, what you use as micro optics, but you can see the efficiency is quite, quite good and the homogeneity become very good. And this, for this application and signaling function, we think that we can do a lot of things about micro -opti optics uh, implementation in the future. Because this is the first step, but I am sure that we can have a second and third steps on this topic. This was about uh, signaling function. When we talk about lighting, so I have seen the presentation from different uh, companies, especially um, from SUS. So I think uh, we will talk a bit about this topic. But then what we have today, indeed, on the Polestar 2, for example, we have a pixel solution. So you can see the size of the module. You have the LEDs, you have the primary optics, and you have the optical system. And then the depth of this sort of module is around 200 millimeters with the heat sink. You can say 150 millimeters without the heat sink. So it is quite an uh, important uh, depth. So what are the requirements when we talk about lighting? About lighting, so we have also to fulfill lighting uh, requirements or legal requirements. So it is candela values also in different taxes. And then we have a second topic, which is quite important. It is the homogeneity of the beam pattern on the road. So what you see when you drive. So it is quite important. And if you have not something homogeneous, you will see some marking on the road and it is not comfortable when you drive. After you have also a styling request, which is to have very small size module. And about sustainability, you have to have low power consumption also. 
And for packaging, it is what I mentioned just in the previous slide. So we need to have a small depth, a depth of 200 millimeters when you have a car, which is a B, uh, B car like um, Renault Clio, for example, Volkswagen Polo. It is quite impossible to fit this sort of module because you have no place in the engine bay. When you have a premium car like a Volvo S90, so you have a very long car, you can fit this sort of module, but it is quite complex when it is a small car. So when we go to lighting solution, uh, today we have usually two optical systems. It is ellipsoid system or parabola system. So you can see the concept we have. And this concept is exactly the same that the concept we had 20 years ago when we have bulb system. So you have the ellipse with the bulb at one point on the ellipse, you have the shutter and then you have the lens. And when you have um, a parabola system, also you have the bulbs or you have the LED, and then you have some optical system on the reflector, and then you, you have the light and the beam pattern. The, with LEDs, we have not changed the concept. And you can see that this depth is quite important. So it is around 200 millimeters when you have the ellipsoid system. And when you have a parabola system, it can be shorter, it can be 100 millimeters or perhaps 50 millimeters without the heat sink. So when you see the current solution also, when we have some bulb solution for low beam, the power consumption was around 130, 140 watt per car. When you go to a very efficient LED system with a low performance, you can have around 20, 40 watt per car. So we have reduced a lot the power consumption with LED system, but with the height, which is quite important. So the height on this car is around 60 millimeters height, I think. And the optical efficiency is quite good. But when you go to the thinner headlamp, like this Volvo S90, for example, the optical efficiency is less good, between 20, 30%. And then the power consumption has increased between 60 watt, 120 watt. It depends exactly of the performance you want to have. And then you can see that you can have similar performance and similar power consumption as bulb in the past. So we have seen also from SUS, I think, today and from Ella yesterday, also presentation about uh, micro optics uh, with MLA. So we can see that MLA is quite good because about design, it is exactly what designer would like to have today, very thin headlamp. But when we see the cost today, it is really, really expensive. So it is only for premium brand and it is really expensive also for premium brand. Also what I see is that the power consumption is really important. Uh, what I have in mind is that the efficiency is around 10%. And then you need to put a lot of LEDs and you need to have some lot of heat sinks to evacuate the temperature. So it is not so good and it is not something for all the car makers. So what I don't know today is what would be the second step? How can we reduce the cost of this technology? Because this technology is very good, but today it is not for all the people. Perhaps it will be one of the topic for the fabulous industry. And then if we want to do a sort of a specification for the freeform optics, so what could be interesting for automotive industry is that we should be able to reduce the depth of the optical system. So it is exactly what, uh, what presented Marcel uh, 30 minutes ago. So instead of having a depth about 100, 200 millimeters, we should be able to go to a depth around 50 millimeters. Then the efficiency, the target should be above 50%. This is uh, equivalent to something very efficient with LED. That's what we have seen uh, previously. And for the striding, it would be very good because it will be a new freedom for designers. So the third topic we have also discussed, it was presented by Do Dr. Optics and also for, by Glowing, it is a road projection. So this road projection we have today in welcome scenario on the BMW, but we could have in the future on um, external lighting also to project some information and to project also signaling function like turn indicator or stop lamp. It is, we have discussion ongoing with regulation in Geneva now to be able to propose these sort of things in one or two years. So today we have some solution with MLA we have seen, or we have some solution also with DLP from Texas Instrument to be able to do these sort of things. And the question is how can we reduce drastically the cost with freeform optics because today it is quite expensive. And if we want to be able to fit this sort of solution on a lot of cars tomorrow, 
because I think it will increase safety, so this is good. But then we have to find technology and solutions that will be cheaper than what we have today on the market. So this was the end of my presentation. I think I can answer to some questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you Pauline, for the presentation. Really, really interesting to get your your requirements and, and, and your needs on, on these different uh, different topics. And um, I think that we should have some question from the participant um, who wants to maybe to answer to the question how to reduce the costs or what could be the second step of the of the, of the slide in one map. And uh, I I remember, yeah. Okay, Marco Svetini from Maueli, please, Marco. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me, yeah? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this really interesting uh, meeting. I discovered it <laughs> thanks uh, to Mr. Sh uh, um, uh, Dr. Optic, Hagen, uh, I don't know how to, 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 to say it, uh, Schweizer. Uh, because it's a contact for me in LinkedIn, and I discovered it uh, last uh, during the last days, uh, thanks to him. But that's really, really interesting and helpful, I think, uh, reach of uh, documentation and the know-how, especially. So uh, just a suggestion, I don't know if in the future there will be other opportunities, but uh, a, a really fashioning technology that is coming out uh, in a strong way during this period, uh, at least from my point of view, is uh, the femtolaser uh, milling technology uh, that is opening some uh, opportunities. Uh, we have different suppliers that are uh, suggesting, proposing this technology, but uh, from my point of view, strictly from the optical point of view, I'm not uh, uh, fully confident uh, on the final result that we can achieve. So. We are doing many investigations internally here in Marelli for that, especially rela related to the uh, dispersion that we can have uh, due to the surface finishing and so on. But uh, it could be an interesting uh, open point uh, for future discussion, I think, that was only for that. Thank you, Marco, for your point of view. Yes, well, thank really you for your comment. Something? Yeah, just about phantom laser. I think phantom laser is used for signaling function, especially to improve the homogeneity. So it seems to be a promising technology. We have seen that um, it is quite complex to apply. So for Marelli or for your competitors, we have seen that it is not so easy. So I think we, we need to focus on this topic, how we can simulate, uh, how we can produce quite easily, and uh, how we can... Um, mm we can have more phantom laser technology in the future in our automotive industry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, there, there, there's opportunity for um, graining for sure, but uh, we are still using it uh, with nano laser, for example. Uh, but femto is uh, really interesting because uh, from the paper, it seems to be able to achieve really mirror a uh, micro optic dimension. So we are speaking about something less than 0 0.3 millimeters. But, uh, but um, some first results I have suggest me to be really careful about the surface finishing and consequently mm -hmm. to the dispersion that the, the, the final surface will, uh, will produce. But uh, as I said, for me, it's an open point uh, uh, in terms of technology to be used uh, for the future. But uh, yes, also the opinion of the colleagues here, for me, would be uh, interesting for the future. Because uh, as I say, this is an interesting, uh, um, an interesting, let me say, meeting. And the know-how is very high here, as, uh, as I understood. Yes, for sure. Thank you, Marco. For your feed. Welcome. Back and, Thanks and, to uh, you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, another question from Rainer. Rainer, please, Polish. Uh, yeah, to Henry, uh, to Paul Henry. Uh, is there any activities ongoing and and looking for alternative light sources? I mean, I know that in many aspects for front lighting, the industry is going away from laser, uh, from laser-driven light sources. Um, 
do you think you can you can find better LEDs nowadays? Are you in contact to the LED industry? Because you are talking about efficiency. And if you want to increase the efficiency, you need to increase the luminance of LED. That means you mean you need you need smaller LEDs basically. Uh, especially when you are working with freeform design and partly also MLAs. What is your answer on this question? So we are working with um, LED suppliers, so all the automotive industry. Uh, especially we work with Nietzsche, Lumiled, and Osram, and after we have Samsung and others. But uh, they have developed some high luminance LED for the moment. So we have seen that... Um, When we have a smaller chip, it is quite complex. We can reduce the focal length, but it is good for um, high range of functionality like high beam, but not really for other solutions. Mm -hmm. But uh, after they are developing the micro LED technology now, so the main focus, but about luminance, what we see, they have their roadmap and we see that uh, every year they increase um, efficiency about 10%. So if you have uh, one year 400 lumens, the year after you can have 440 lumens. Okay. But after when we have a higher luminance, uh, higher performance, it is quite difficult to evacuate. Uh, we have thermal issue. So it is quite difficult. So you have some limitation and technical limitation because when the chip is too small, you cannot uh, dissipate okay. the temperature. So we have, uh, we have limitation. Okay. Thank you, Paul Henry. Thank you, Rena. Thanks a lot for your question. And thanks again to Paul Henry for, for your presentation. And now uh, I suggest to, to start the, um, the networking, the Q&A session about Fabulous. So if you have, uh, if you have some, some questions, we have uh, Jessica who is in the room. We have also Tom with in the room, yeah, for your technical question. And uh, what we can do now, well, not a lot, maybe I would like to, to start um, a room table a kind of room table, then you can introduce yourself, introduce your, your interest in, in Fabulous and in this workshop. And I would like maybe to start with uh, Rolando, Rolando Ferrini from Film to Print. Hi, Jeremy. Hello. Good morning, everybody. So um, nice to uh, uh, see all the people interested in Fabulous. I know a bit about Fabulous, but I'm Uh, I work now since since February for a company called Fentoprint. We do um, microstructuring in glass with uh, laser-based technologies. So we do uh, micro optics, we do waveguides, uh, we can do we can support um, the pilot line. Uh, we are part of the uh, of the marketplace. We can support with mastering or prototyping services. Yeah, thank you. And can you think, tell us a little bit more about Fabulous because you know you know a lot about this uh, this project. Uh, well, yes, as I said, I know a bit uh, uh, about Fabulous. I think it's uh, I, I remain convinced <laughs> that it's a very good platform and pilot line to put together a very complex value chain uh, to address the needs of different uh, uh, market segments, as Jessica was commenting. And today we have the automotive, where there is a boom of uh, application of micro-optics in several places in the car. And, uh, but uh, these solutions need to have, uh, to have access to specific technologies. And it's not always easy, as we see today, to put together the right technologies if you start from the... Um, mastering the origination of the masters then you go to the right imprint you need to have the right materials the right design the right uh, in certain cases packaging or the right material properties so it's very complex and and usually uh, it requires a lot of time for people that are not in the field to set up an entire value chain that can be found today uh, in fabulous already optimized with the work done in the last uh, in the last two years from the technical teams of the uh, of the members of the pilot line Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Rolando. And um, I would like maybe to ask to, we have someone from Stellantis, Nero Rikira. Could you introduce yourself and, and present your interest in Fabulous in this workshop? No. Marco, Marco Svetini, you asked a question to, to Paul Henri. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more to, about your, 
your activity and also about your interest in, uh, in yes absolutely yes hello i switched on i'm oh, sorry the camera again yeah. sorry perfect yes i'm marcus vettini i'm a computational phys phys physician and um, i work uh, in uh, in um, marelli now now called marelli before um, automotive lighting um since uh, 12 years and since uh, one year i'm uh, the optical development manager uh, before was uh, sara paroni that maybe you know and um, now she's uh, in charge of quality uh, high quality department here in in automotive tolmezzo so and um, i also saw that uh, during the presentation there were uh, the seven series car for from bmw uh, that are really exciting because I was the optical uh, the optical designer of uh, of both uh, the the series seri seven series the the rear lamp obviously okay mm -hmm. and so for me is uh, <laughs> really interesting to to see the, the picture in your presentations and um, yes I'm I'm manager but. I'm technician first of all, optical designer especially. I worked also on uh, on sensors in uh, in previous experience in steel industry for uh, um, measurements, of, so non-contact measurements with uh, optical sensors and um, also with uh, ultrasonic and uh, electromagnetic. Uh, uh sensors applications but uh, mm -hmm. optics for me is the mainstream let me say of my of my job after the degree so i'm really interested in in everything uh, that concerned to the to the automotive especially but also from other from other uh, technologies and uh, in uh, intel mezzo we have also an innovation department uh, who uh, hits by federico Iannacone. Um, and I'm directly in contact uh, with uh, every day with uh, the colleagues, uh, optical colleagues in the innovation department, where we discuss uh, since uh, years every day these technologies. That's all I think. Thank you, Marco. And, and did Welcome. you already know about? Um, did you already heard about Fabulous? Or? No, no, no. That's the first time for me. I was on LinkedIn some days ago. Okay. <laughs> and I saw the post. Uh, from uh, Mr. Hagen Schweitzer, and uh, so I asked uh, to participate because for me this was uh, really interesting, and uh, mm -hmm. I confirm <laughs> this expectation absolutely. Okay, so if you have some question regarding fabulous, you can ask here or you can contact Jessica. Anyway. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And um, Holof from Equipe Optic, Optics, sorry, could you introduce yourself? Yes, hello, I'm Olaf hello. from Net Eclipse. Um, we're an optical design house in, in Stockholm, build prototypes and and do some testing. Hello. So um, my interest in micro optics has been going on for a while. We've done some, some designs. Um, I think the application area where I've worked mostly is for automotive is in LiDAR. So I worked a lot for, for Vioneer uh, doing LiDAR and I think this is a very interesting area for for micro optics both in the uh, projection of of with scanning and also in in the, in the detection channels mm -hmm. for miniaturization and for or there was a, a nice epic uh, uh, conference on this a while while back but yeah yeah but that's true we, we talk a lot about lighting and simulation but uh, hot topic also is a leader for sure for micro optics in the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And did you know? Did you heard about uh, Fabulous? Or I think curious, I've or? heard about it. Yes, but I I learned more about about yeah. it this time. Great. And very interesting presentations. Great, thank you for your feedback. And um, we have someone from Nanocomp, Ville Nisinen. Hello, how are you how are you here? No. Okay. And Daniela, Daniela, you, you asked many questions during the, um, this workshop. That's great. Thank you. And uh, could you introduce yourself? 
Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniela Kathaus. Um, I work at Hella since 2014. First of all, in the research department, um, yeah, I made some research on holography for automotive applications. And um, now I'm in the innovations department. And the focus topic for me is um, diffractive optics, micro optics, free from optics, holography. And um, yeah, at the beginning, when, when um, yeah, the project of Fabulous started, uh, yeah, we were asked to participate and um, yeah, I was really curious about it and it's a really nice project and um, yeah, I hope that, or I, I already hear that uh, it was possible to share these interesting aspects today in this workshop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And um, Michael Mathieu from TU Chemnitz. Michael, are you here? Would you like to introduce yourself? Switch on your camera. Or well, someone from Villans, Villans UPMT, you are also a partner of Fabulous. Would you like to tell us more about how you are involved in this project? Yes, hello, Jeremy, thank you. Hello. Uh, introducing us. So um, as you said, uh, we are involved in the, in the Fabulous project. So uh, at UPMT, uh, we have uh, developed some patented technologies to uh, be able to uh, machine uh, lens array masters uh, with uh, very high accuracy. So uh, this is why we were involved in the, in the Fabulous project. We have al already worked on multiple applications like uh, AR, VR, or automotive applications. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I would like also to ask to, to Hagen, uh, you are um, one of our speakers. Did, did you heard uh, before uh, about Fabulous? Sorry, did, did not have, can, you, can you repeat? Did, did you heard before, um, before this workshop about Fabulous uh, projects? Yes. Uh, you already know. Uh, not, not a long time before, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Yeah. okay. So it was interesting for me also to, to see this initial talk, uh, talk about uh, Fabulous, yeah. Great. And uh, Lucas Hiller, you want to introduce yourself? You're from Hela. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm Lucas Hiller. Um, I'm a PhD student here at Hela. And I'm also working on the topic of holography. So the thing that Daniela started uh, years earlier is uh, continued here at uh, Hella, and I'm doing research regarding the holography and applications in headlights and real lights. Yeah, and uh, I'm really interested in, yeah, in all the speeches today um, because um, yeah, I think there might be some interesting um, yeah, calculation opportunities that would also suit for my topic. And I think there's uh, yeah, a lot of uh, cross section between micro optics and um, diffractive or holography optics. Um, yeah, and this is why I'm here to yeah, ch check out all these interesting um, topics. Thank you, Lucas, for your introduction. Nice to meet you. And uh... yeah, we have someone from the Castro Institute of Technology, Mohamed Mobarak. Are you here? If you want to introduce yourself. Okay. So do you have more questions for, for Jessica? Take the occasion, take the opportunity. She is here. She's available. But fabulous. And if you have no more questions, uh, sorry, about... one, uh, last question from my yes, side. Marco, uh, do, do, do you plan some um, new uh, appointment for the future regarding different topics uh, related, obviously, to micro optics and so on? Like like this one, like this workshop. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lisanda, do you have a plan? Yeah, there is something we are we have to think about because there are a lot of applications of. Uh, free for micro optics and well we will just keep you updated since we, we have your email yeah we can send information the during the next uh, month once everything is 
defined. Okay, thank you. So thank you for your interest. It's a it's a really nice story that you heard yes. about this yes. and in thank England, you. and then you're here. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Okay, so if we have no more questions, I think that maybe we can close this workshop. Thanks a lot to our speakers and to the participants. It was great to get you here among us and to, to get also your question. Thanks to yeah, Marcel, Hagan, all the speakers. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mark, also, Nolan. And maybe Jessica, if you, if you want to say some ending words, I'll let you. Uh, yes, for me, it was also very interesting, very interesting to see what the companies are developing, uh, see quite some opportunities also to collaborate and work together. So I put my email in the chat, but uh, I will also contact some of you and follow up on, uh, on some of the talks that we've had here today. So thank you everyone so much. And uh, yeah, final words are always uh, micro optics is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh, bye -bye. See you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.